You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but it is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our Old Testament reading today is from the 65th chapter of Isaiah. For I'm about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating, for I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in my people. No more shall the sound of weeping be heard in it or the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant that lives but a few days or an old person who does not live out a lifetime. For one who dies at a hundred years will be considered a youth and one who falls short of a hundred will be considered accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they, shall be, for they shall be offspring blessed by the Lord and their descendants as well. Before they call, I will answer. While they're yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, but the serpent, its food shall be dust. They shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. I'm glad to be here. Of course, at my age, I'm glad to be anywhere. <laughs> I told my mother once, when I get up to speak, I always feel nervous. She said, when you get up to speak, God gets nervous. <laughs> I want to say a special thanks to Zachary. Uh, that thing you did on the cello was just magnificent. Uh, at the top of every piece of music that Bach wrote, he inscribed the words, for the glory of God. And as you played, I felt it was for the glory of God. So thank you. And And, and people, you did not act like Baptists. When, when the choir finished singing, I thought you would applaud at that point. <laughs> Thank you very much. I mean, this is really a classy church. <laughs> when somebody referred to the room outside the sanctuary as the narthex, <laughs> whoa! Whoa! <laughs> In my low-class Baptist church, we refer to it as the vestibule. <laughs> Good to be at this great church and to worship with you this morning. I often ask my students at Eastern University, this is a Baptist school, a Baptist university, a solidly Baptist. Uh, I'm Baptist. Uh, I said to the early service, you don't have to be Baptist to go to heaven. Amen? Amen. But why take a chance? You know, that's <laughs> the question that has to be asked. The guy's preaching away and saying, is everybody here Baptist? And one guy said, no, I'm Methodist. He said, why are you Methodist? He said, my mother was Methodist. My father was Methodist. So they raised me Methodist. He said, that's the dumbest thing. If your mother was an ignoramus and your father was an ignoramus, would you be an ignoramus? He said, no, I'd probably be a Baptist. You know, that was just his words. <laughs> when I speak to my students at this uh, intensely Baptist school, uh, why did Jesus come into the world? What was his mission? Every church has a mission statement, trying to spell out the unique calling of that particular church. Every 
business now begins to develop a mission statement. Individuals have mission statements. If you ask Jesus, I would say to my students, what's your mission? Can you put it into a soundbite? Can you reduce it to a one-liner? Jesus would say, this is my mission. My mission is to declare that the kingdom of God is at hand. I usually get all kinds of good answers from the students, but seldom get that answer. He came to seek and to save the lost. He came to reveal God. He came to reveal what it means to be an actualized human being. Uh, he, he came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. It goes on and on, but Jesus said, Matthew, Mark, Luke, check it out in your Bible. The first thing he says in initiating his ministry is this, I have come to declare that the kingdom of God is at hand. And may I say, for years growing up in my church, I didn't get it because I always thought that the kingdom of God was a place you went to after you died. And it was always about getting us ready to die. I remember as a 12-year-old kid sitting there and the minister yelling from the pulpit, looking at me, <laughs> are you ready to die? I'm 12 years old. <laughs> but if that didn't scare me, he always had threat number two. He said, you don't know when a trumpet would sound and the Lord would return. What will you do when the trumpet sounds? Where will you be? The next time I went to the movies, I was scared to death. I was sure we were gonna get halfway through the flick and the trumpet would sound. <laughs> Throughout eternity, I'd be grabbing people and shaking them and saying, do you, know, do you know how that movie ended? <laughs> well, the Lord may return. And who knows, but I might drop dead. And indeed, I'm glad at my age to hear that there is good news for those who are in Christ, that though they die, yet shall they live. I belong to an African-American church in West Philadelphia. It's a very large church. And uh, I, I, I remember my first African-American funeral I had only been to a, Italian funerals before and people yell and scream and tear their clothes. It's, it's very depressing. <laughs> uh, but to go to an African-American funeral, now that was something I had never experienced. The joy, the excitement of the whole thing. The preacher preached for about, uh, you know, uh, 20 minutes on what life after death would be like. And people, he made it sound so great that halfway through that talk, I wished I was dead, you know? I mean, it was wonderful. And then he came down and spoke words of comfort to the congregation, uh, more specifically to the family, comforting them, promising them peace. And the last thing he did is he went over to the open casket. And the last 20 minutes, he preached to the corpse. You say, what's that like? to preach to a corpse. Ask your pastor. He'll... <laughs> he just yelled. He just yelled, Clarence! Clarence, he yelled. And people, he said it with such authority, I would not have been surprised had Clarence responded. <laughs> he said, Clarence, you got away too quickly. There are a lot of things you did for us that we never said thank you for, and we're going to say them now. And he went down this litany of beautiful, wonderful things that Clarence had done for people. And when he finished, he said, well, that's it, Clarence. There's nothing more to say except this. Now, Pastor, if you're doing a funeral, do not pull this off. It won't work with you. Okay. <laughs> he grabbed the lid of the casket, and he yelled at the corpse, good night. Good night, Clarence, and he slammed the thing shut. <laughs> Shock waves went over the congregation. And when he looked up, you could see there was a smile on his face. And he said, good night, Clarence. Good night, Clarence, cause I know, I know God is gonna give you a good morning. And the choir was up on his feet singing on that great getting up morning, we shall rise, we shall rise. And we were all up on our feet and we were dancing in the aisles, which they don't do at this church. And, 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 and we were hugging each other. And, 
and I knew I was in the right church. A church that could take a funeral and turn it into a celebration. That people is the church of Jesus Christ. Oh death, where is your sting? Oh grave, where is your victory? Praise be to God who gives us victory. So I don't want to minimize that life after death thing. Not at my age, almost 84, you know. I like that. But when Jesus said, I came, he didn't say I came to get you into heaven. I came to declare that the kingdom of God is at hand. When the disciples asked him to pray, uh, he said, I'll tell you what to pray for. Pray for the kingdom. You know the prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done where? On earth. Man, this is not a Pentecostal congregation. <laughs> <laughs> Let me try that again. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done where? On earth. That's right, on earth. It's not pie in the sky when you die. It's this world. Jesus came to create a people who would transform this world into his kingdom. It says at the end of the first chapter of Ephesians, he shall bring all principalities, all powers, all thrones into subjection to himself through the church. The church is the instrument through which God is transforming the world. You say, wait a minute. It's such a feeble, dying thing. You're saying this is going to transform the world? People, we get a lot of bad press. But I want to tell you, we don't celebrate the church. Consider this, 25 years ago, 40,000 children died every single day from either starvation or diseases related to malnutrition. Today it's down to 17,000. And who's been responsible for building the hospitals? sending the doctors, the nurses, setting up clinics all over the third world, developing nations. It's been the church. It's been the church. 25 years ago, one out of every six persons on the planet had no access to clean drinking water. Today, it's one out of 12. The situation has improved 100%. And guess who has drilled most of the wells? Go to the United Nations, ask the question. Now their humanity division, it's been the church. We're the ones that have improved the access to clean drinking water 100% of what it was 25 years ago. 25 years ago, 80% of the population of the world was illiterate. Today it's down to 20%. That's what we've done. That's the church of Jesus Christ. 25 years ago, I got a call from Millard Fuller he was putting together this board for Habitat for Humanity, and you've got a chapter here in this church. He said, we're going to build houses for poor people. I said, that's great. He said, we're going to build houses, and we're going to sell them to poor people with no down payment, because they can't come up with one. We're going to give them long-term mortgages with no interest on the mortgages, because the Old Testament says we shouldn't charge interest to the poor. And we're going to build these houses. We're going to raise money for building materials and build them. I said, great. It all sounds great. How are you going to pay the carpenters, the electricians, the plumbers to build these houses? He said, we're going to get church people to volunteer. I said, church people are going to build houses. He said, right. 25 years later, Habitat for Humanity completed. Hear this carefully completed its one millionth house. Did you hear that figure? Can any politician you can name make that kind of a claim? Can any political party make that kind of claim? Of course not. But I want to tell you the Church of Jesus Christ can make that claim. It's about time we recognize the greatness of what's going on in the world under the guidance of the Holy Spirit as the Spirit invades people, possesses people, and directs them to be agents of change, transforming the world that is into the kind of world that God wants for it to be. The church de deserves a cheer instead of a put down. So I want to hear it from you people. For the church of Jesus Christ, hip, hip. Hooray! Hip, hip. Hooray! Hip, hip. Hip, hip. You didn't cheer. 
The truth of the matter is, we are the greatest success story that ever came down the pike. You say, well, I don't see it here in the United States. No, the United States is in bad shape. But go to Africa, where 50,000 new people are added to the church every single week. Go to China, where in 1945, there were 900,000 Christians. Today, there are 77 million Christians. The church is exploding all over the world. The fact that it's not doing well here in the United States has more to do with the fact that we have been seduced into materialism and away from spirituality than the church of Jesus Christ has been failing Jesus. Jesus' work, even through this beat up American church, great things are happening. And it's about time we tell a younger generation that's the case because I'm tired of sophomores saying, the church is full of hypocrites. Have you ever heard that one? That's why I always say, that's why you're going to feel at home among us. <laughs> you, you, really, you really need to come to our church. I mean, it's full of hypocrites. The minute you walk in, you're going to say, my kind of people. That's what we are. We are hypocrites. But this difference, we're hypocrites who through the studying of God's Word, through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, are endeavoring to overcome our hypocrisy. Brothers and sisters, says the Scripture, it hath not yet appeared what we shall be. But one day we shall see Him, and then we shall be like Him. Whenever I sign a book, I always sign it, Philippians 3, 13 or 14. Not as though I've already attained, not as though I've already apprehended, but forgetting those things that are behind. I'm pressing towards the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. That's where we need to go, to where Jesus is calling us to be. When Jesus said the kingdom of God is at hand, his audience knew what he was talking about because they were steeped on what the kingdom of God was like. You heard it read to you in part today when they read the 65th chapter of Isaiah, starting at the 17th verse. And when the kingdom comes, says that chapter, no more will children die in infancy. We still have 17,000 children dying every day in infancy because of lack of food, because of lack of medicine, because of lack of... 17,000 a day. No more will that be the case when the people of God finish doing the work that God has empowered us to do on this planet. When that day comes, old people will live out their lives in health and well-being. That's what it said. The man that dies at 100, the woman that dies at 100, will be considered most unfortunate. Health, well-being for old people. Oh, how we need that in a society where there are elderly people in Texas who have to decide between buying food and paying for medicine. No more will that be the case when the kingdom is actualized and the church completes the work that God has given the church to do. When the kingdom comes, children will, I love that line, I just noticed it today, children will not be born to calamity. You won't have mothers in North Philadelphia who when they give birth to a child wonder whether that kid's gonna become a drug addict or be blown away in a gang battle. No more will that be the case. And everyone says the scripture, you read it, will have a job in the vineyard. And everybody will have decent pay for their labor and not somebody else. In other words, you won't have sneakers being produced in Thailand while the workers are being paid $2 a day so we can buy bargains at Walmart. No more will that be the case when the kingdom comes. You say, what's this got to do with us? This is the kind of world we're supposed to be committed to creating. We should be working towards this end. We should be moving towards this end. This is why I want you to surrender your life to Christ today. I want Christ to become a personal savior. I don't want you just to believe in the doctrines. I want you to invite Christ to invade you, to flow into you, to come alive within you, and take you and use you as an instrument for his kingdom changing the world that is into the kingdom that he wills for it to be. Oh, we, we sing about it when we sing the Hallelujah Chorus at Christmas and Easter. That's the way it should be. Instead, our kids go off to universities and they get depressed. They read T.S. Eliot. Now there's something that will depress everybody. <laughs> you know that 
wasteland poem of his, which ends, this is the way the world will end. This is the way the world will end. This is the way the world will end. Not with a bang, but a whimper. Oh, jeez. <laughs> no wonder they're depressed when they come home for break. The truth is, T.S. Eliot had a way with words, but he was wrong. The world will not end with a bang or a whimper. Let me tell you what it says in the scriptures and what we sing at Easter and at Christmas. We sing this, and the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our God, and he shall reign forever and ever. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And that's why they call it the good news. That's why they call it the good news. I don't know why we're all so downhearted when we have this message of hope in the midst of a world that seems to be filled with despair. Let me just tell you the good news. We are called to change the world. We're called to change the world. I teach, as I said, at this Baptist school in just outside of Philadelphia, and we've had some illustrious graduates. One that's become very famous as of late is Brian Stevenson, who's earned an outstanding reputation. As you see him portrayed on television time and time again as the defender of the poor as they face the electric chair or the gas chamber. He graduated top of the class at Eastern, went from Eastern to Harvard Law, made law review, could have gone to work on Wall Street for a quarter of a million dollars a year could be a millionaire a mully times over. Instead, he walked away from it all, moved to Birmingham, Alabama, started a program called the Equal Justice Initiative, in which he defends poor people who are being judged for capital crimes. To date, I think he's gotten something like 180 people off of death row, many of them innocent because they didn't have a good lawyer when they went to trial. He said, you know why people go to the electric chair, Tony? They may be guilty, they may not be guilty. But the reason why they go to the electric chair is because they don't have anybody really good to speak for them when they have their day in court. And then he looked at me and he said, except in Montgomery, Alabama. In Montgomery, Alabama, Doc, I'm the voice of the poor. I speak for the poor, and Doc, I'm good. <laughs> I'm really good, and I thought to myself, Brian, you don't know how good you are. You didn't sell out to the system. You didn't yield to the allurements of wealth and prestige and power. You were willing to sacrifice who you are and what you have to serve the kingdom of God, to try to change the world, I said, you don't believe in capital punishment. He said, how can anybody in America believe in capital punishment when there's two kinds of justice? One kind of justice for rich people and another kind of justice for poor people. Please, don't argue with me on this one. You know it to be true. He said, poor people go to the chair because they don't have somebody like me to stand up for them when they have their day in court. What a story a young man who's changing America, an instrument of God, changing the world that is into the world that ought to be. I have a friend who's a school teacher. He won the award in Minnesota as Teacher of the Year for the state, but on top of that, he won the award for the entire nation. They brought him to Washington to receive the medal from the president. I said to him one day, Guy, why did you become an English teacher? He said, when I was in the eighth grade, I was hard, horribly overweight. The boys and girls made fun of me at school. I hated school. He said, when we came to the end of the eighth grade, the teacher said, you're going on to high school. It's going to be different. For instance, you're going to have physical education every Friday. I didn't know what that was, but she explained. Once a week, you'll go down to the locker room and you'll strip down naked and get in your gym clothes. When she said strip down naked, I froze. I knew what would happen when I took off all my clothes and my ugly fat body would be there for people to laugh at. 
I remember that first Friday. Only the guys will understand this. Your mother always tells you when you put on your underwear, make sure the label is in the back. <laughs> that is true for everything except for a jock strap. <laughs> the guys know. The jock strap has the label in the front. Without thinking, I grabbed the jock strap and pulled it on backwards. <laughs> the bellows of laughter that echoed through that locker room drove me to tears. After that, I was sick every Friday. I didn't pretend to be sick. The minute I realized it was Friday, my stomach would heave. At the end of the first week in high school, I was leaving English class, and the teacher said, Guy, I want you to remain behind for a few moments. I went over to his desk. He opened a book of poetry, handed me the book, and he said, I want you to go to the back of the room, and with all the energy you can muster, with all the expression you can give it, I want you to read the poem. He said, I'll never forget the poem. The poem was Casey at the Bat. And I went to the back of the room, and I poured myself into reading that poem with all the expression I could conjure up. And when I finished, he just sat there and stared at me. And then he said, Guy Dowd, I knew it. You are a poet. When he said that, I felt a warm tear run down my cheek. I stumbled out of that classroom into the hallway. I leaned across the wall, and I said out loud, not caring who would hear me. I remember saying out loud, when I grow up, I'm going to be an English teacher, a boy whose life was changed through a simple act of kindness. You say, that doesn't change the world. It does change the world. It's not with swords loud clashing, nor the sound of beating drums, goes on the old hymn, but with simple acts of kindness, the heavenly kingdom comes. I was in Haiti, where some of my students were working. I got out of the van to go into the Holiday Inn, where I always stay in Port-au-Prince. I was walking across the sidewalk when I was intercepted by three girls. The one in the middle said, Mister, for $10, you can have me all night long. I was stunned. I looked at the one next to her. I said, and you? Do I get you for $10? She nodded, yes. I, I looked at the third one, and, and she said, yes. I said, you're in luck. I've got $30. I'm in room 210. You be up there in a half hour, but not before. Do you understand? I rushed up to the room. I got on the phone. I called down to the concierge desk. I said, I want every Walt Disney video you've got in stock. Send them all up to room 210. I called down to the restaurant. I said, do you still make banana splits? I want extra ice cream on each of them, extra whipped cream, extra syrup and nuts and cherries. And, 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 and I, I want four of them. The videos came, the banana splits came, and we sat on the edge of the bed and we watched Disney till about two in the morning. And that's when the last of them fell asleep across the bed. And as I sat there looking at their little bodies strewn across the bed, I thought, nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. Tomorrow they'll be back on the street selling themselves to dirty, filthy Johns because there will always be dirty, ugly men who for $10 will destroy a little girl. Nothing's changed. And then there was a voice in the depths of my being. I felt these words. But for one night, Tony, for one night, you let them be children once again. For one night, you gave them back their childhood. You did what you could. People, that's all the Lord ever asks of us, that each of us does what each of us could do to bring in the kingdom, 
through kindness, working for justice, working against racism, sexism, militarism, to try to change the world from what it is into the kingdom of God. A kingdom, a kingdom in which there is justice and love. I don't know what you think becoming a Christian is. You say, well, I accepted Jesus as my personal savior. This is the evidence. Are you willing to say, Jesus, I can't do it without you. I want you to be in me. I want to not only believe in the doctrines, I want you to personally invade me, become alive in me, and make me into an agent of your kingdom, transforming this world from what it is into the kind of world you want it to be. That's what we're called to do. That's what we're called to be, the people of God at work in the world, changing the world that is into the kind of world that it, it's supposed to be. I'll give you a little invitation today. First, I want to invite you to surrender your life to Christ. I don't mean just believe in him. My goodness, who else comes out to church on a Sunday morning except people that believe in Jesus? Of course you believe Jesus. That's not the question. Have you come to that point where you're saying, Jesus, I'll be what you want me to be. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll go where you want me to go. I want to surrender and allow your spirit to invade me and lead me to do your work in the world. Are you willing to surrender yourself to Jesus? They told Soren Kierkegaard, they used the church for a dance on Saturday night. And he said, better to use it for a dance on Saturday night than to use it on Sunday morning to make a fool out of God. You say, what do you mean a fool out of God? We stand up and sing, all to Jesus I surrender. All to him I gladly give. Do we really mean that? Are we ready to surrender ourselves to Jesus? To say, here's my life, take it, let it be holy, yielded, Lord, to thee? I'm inviting you this morning not to believe in Jesus and become a believer. You're already believers, that's why you're here. I'm asking you to become a disciple. And you know there's a big difference between being a believer and being a disciple. Jesus never said, go into all the world and make believers out of everybody. He said, go into all the world and make disciples. Are you saying, you know, I've been playing at this thing for a long time. It's about time I become radical and say, here I am, Lord, take me. Use me. I surrender. I ask you to invade me and lead me. And as many as are led by the Spirit of God, says the eighth chapter of Romans, they are the children of God. One last thing. I always like to ask people to do something concrete. You can support a child in a third world country for $1.35 a day. You can feed the child, clothe the child, educate the child, provide medical care for the child. You can deliver the whole ball of wax, including the story of Jesus, to a child in a third world country. Won't you do that? I'll be in the back of the church and I have little cards and I'll give them to you with how to do it, how to, how to sign up for a child in a third world country. You don't have to do this. Do you understand? You don't have to do it. But if you don't, <laughs> all the elastic in your underwear will snap before you get to your car. <laughs> so if you see people walking across the parking lot, holding up their trousers, point to them, humiliate them. <laughs> of course, in all seriousness, don't you want a kid standing next to you on Judgment Day? So when it says in the 25th chapter of Matthew, I was hungry, did you feed me? Naked, did you clothe me? Sick, did you care for me? I was a stranger. I was the alien from another country. Did you welcome me into your country? Don't you want there to be a kid next to you? You know, so you can hit him and say, tell him, tell him, tell him. And Jesus will say, "Inasmuch as much as you have done it under the least of these, you've done it unto me.
If you're not supporting a child, do support it. You say, I'm, I'm old, and uh, you can support a child. They'll send you a picture. You can put the picture on your refrigerator. When your grandchild comes by and says, who's that? You say, I have a grandchild you don't know about. <laughs> Freak them out. Freak them out. People of God, hear the clarion call not to be believers, but to be disciples, to spread the good news. I am an agent of God for the transformation of the world.